And welcome to another episode of Life Plus. I'm your host, Dr. Marilyn Johnson, and... I'm Audrey Galix. Thanks so much for being with us. We are standing outside of Candler Plaza Barbershop. <laughs> it is quite a place. Well, you know, the barbershop is one of the really, really oldest institutions in the African-American community, and all communities, actually. And this is a place where the guys love to hang out, so you're going to learn some fun stuff today about why they like it so much. Yeah, it's quite a cast of characters. You're also going to meet <laughs> uh, some folks to, who are talking about why some younger women are going gray and whether or not some of us older women are staying gray. Well, as you can see, I'm embracing it. And I'm embracing the natural hair. That's also another trend that is very healthy. And I'm really pleased about it. And we'll talk about that, too. And then you're going to meet, again, Jane Ratliff of uh, Blue Hair Technology Group. She'll have our tech tip. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Plus, plus we'll have a profile. That surprise profile. Yeah, you want to stay tuned for that. That's right. <laughs> It's Friday morning at Candler Plaza Barbershop in Decatur, Georgia. Some of the regulars are already here. It's a place to bring your coffee, sit a while. The conversation, wide ranging, though it's mostly about politics. What, what do you think about Hillary uh, uh, in town yesterday? Hillary raised that money. Yeah. Did you send a check on that? Yeah. The talk is pointed, yet jovial, never disrespectful. I don't see her being a conservative. So, you know, I gotta wait to see who else comes in town. We discuss everything from sports to politics, even to race, and we have a good time doing it. But the mom is the problem in the car. The car, come on now. The kids. Perhaps it's such a good time because of this man. That's Master Barber Marshall Wheeler. Been cutting hair about 50 years. But you're only 50 years old. <laughs> you know how to make an old man feel good, that's for sure. <laughs> a quick look, and you might think the place is a throwback to another era. In some ways, it is. We hadn't tried to change anything. It's like old school. You coming in, you feel at home. Everybody get involved. Everybody talk. Everybody have a good time. Nobody mad. Nobody cussing going on. You know, it's just a good, good, good atmosphere. You know. Yeah. She got an excellent chance to become oh, no, no, no. You said the same thing about Obama. I sure did. <laughs> the barbershop has long served an important function in African American culture and still does. In my opinion, the barbershop is important in the black community because they have a place that they can come talk, they can come uh, sit down and, and get a good haircut and commune and find out what's going on in the neighborhood, in the churches in the neighborhood. Like, we've been here so long, we know what's in, in, in each, each part of this neighborhood, we know what's going on. And that's one of the things that's important, especially to black men. We get quite a few white customers, you know. They come and come, but most of them are black. And they come here and they sit down, they commune with each other, they understand each other, they talk to each other, and they go back. And so the barbershop is very important. It's very important. Back in the old days, you know, the barbershop did everything. They pulled teeth and everything else. But, but now we die, we die into cutting hair. Man, and that's, 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 and, and don't nothing, there's nothing important than you come in with a woolly head and go out looking real pretty. <laughs> that's a beautiful thing. And you know how it is when you go to the beauty shop. You go to the beauty shop and get the hair done, them eyebrows done, that face, you look so beautiful. You know, and that's the same thing with us. We don't look beautiful, but make us handsome. And Mr. Wheeler has seen styles come and go over the years. Yeah, I finished Brown Bible College in 60, 64. Way back then. I, and I cut hair before that. I finished Bible College in 64. Come on in and get a good haircut. Yeah, sure, everybody ain't getting no haircut. Come on, Chuck. Where was Brown College at? Brown Bible College was on Auburn Avenue. That's where everything was for black people. Auburn and Hunter Street. When we went down there to Auburn Avenue. It was up under the Peacock. Y'all probably don't know what the Peacock is, but that's a club. <laughs> So we were down there and we got all ahead and we had a lot of fun on Auburn Avenue. Yeah, and that's why I finished school at and it was, it was good. 
And the thing about it, I finished school one week and was in a barbershop the next week. I was good in my young day. Well, I'm still good now, but in my young day, I was good. Yeah. Come on in. Don't, don't get afraid. There's nothing wrong. <laughs> Marsha Wheeler and Chuck Bowden have worked side by side in the shop for nearly 40 years. It's a partnership that includes a lot of good natured banter and rhythm. Chuck and I have been alone just about anybody else. And we've been hanging in here. And we, you know, we, Chuck and I really love each other. We might like, we act like we don't. But that's what we, <laughs> we really do. We, we, Hey, when we come in, we look for each other. You know, you know, you know how, how some people come on the job and they hate to come because man, I got to go put up that mess today. When he come in the door, he come in messing with me. I enjoy it. We enjoy it. That makes the day go by. And they've got a loyal following. And we do have some customers. They that come by, stop in, they sit down and talk maybe two or three hours. Then they come back maybe two or three times a week. Just you don't have to sit down and talk. And well, I have some customers that I hadn't seen them in probably, say, a month, two or three months. I just call them and then ask them, is everything okay, you know. Some of these clients have been coming in since they were kids, including William Thomas. When I started coming here, my mom used to bring me, I had the big afro. You could come in and no matter what, like, what you really want to talk about, you know, as long as it's nothing out of the derog derogatory, he, he, Mr. Marshall, he gets in, he talks with you, whether, like he says, politics, whether it's about bringing up your kid, parent. Me and him even talked about my relationship. We talked in the chair. And, you know, he was like, son, look, you know, you do what you have to do. Um, even when I said I'm going back to school, he said, Go back to school. Make something of yourself, you know. Have a degree. You have something you can stand on and be able to show your kids. And it's still a place where young and old men and women can come on in and get a good cut and more than that, gain a community. Life Plus will be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to Life Plus. More news you can use to live a Life Plus. To go gray or not to go gray? That for many baby boomers is the question. So, master stylist Melissa Powers of Eleven Hair Salon in Midtown Atlanta says, in general, many baby boomers are willing to take more risk with their tresses. They want to try new shades and new tones, and they want to see more than just one color. Definitely taking a risk. And it's part of an overall trend of wanting to go organic and get away from harsh hair chemicals. And in our industry, I think there are women that are taking the risk of going from hair color to letting the gray show. And uh, I think it's great that they take the risk. And it's all about confidence at the end of the day, really. So if you're gonna feel good about what you have on your hair, your makeup and clothes for that part, because it's part of that process, then I think that you should be able to feel good about it. Those who want to go gray may wish to take it slowly. So therefore we're coming up with color solutions like highlights, maybe starting off with just a 30% change that says, hey, I have gray a little bit, but I don't want to see all of it. So we'll start with just a 30% shift. And then as those grays increase over time, we can go to the 100% change. Nine times out of 10, they're going to look at it from a negative perspective. Well, in my world, that means we have to get rid of it. Uh, because we don't want to see it, or they don't want to see it because they're not speaking positive about it. They start from pulling it, and then it gets to the point where they can't pull those few gray hairs anymore, and it becomes an issue. Uh, I don't like the way it looks. It makes me look older. It's not a color that has a lot of shine and reflects a lot of light. Will she go gray? Well, um, I've been every color of the spectrum being in the industry for a really long time, and I have seen myself with silver and gray tones up against my skin. It doesn't shine as much. I have to put more things on the hair to make the hair healthy and shiny looking. And as far as going gray, probably not. And if you can, talk to a pro. Think about how much time you want to spend tending to your hair. And consider the proverb, gray hair is a crown of glory. It is gained by living a godly life. 
So I've got to tell you, I mean, you know, I'm the, I'm the six-year-old who beat up the bully, and I'm the person who went to Poland alone right after communism is out, and I've done all sorts of things, and I love change. But doing something different with my hair terrified me. This next story wasn't supposed to be about going gray. But when we showed up at author Ann Temkin's home, The Gardenia Bush in Full Bloom, to talk about her latest book, Sight in the Sandstorm, she had just cut her hair after her stylist suggested it would help the transition to going gray. At first, she hesitated. And then there was the issue of, okay, if I go gray, am I gonna become invisible in this society? Because now in, in China, they say that when you reach 60, you're finally old enough to have something worth saying. But in this country, we worship youth. And a lot of times, old people are considered, or just become invisible. And I'm not ready to be invisible, I tell you. So there was, that was scary too. And my hairstylist said, well, the first thing you better do to make it not so horribly painless, so it's not a six month to a year terrible process of growing out roots, is to um, cut it really short, a sort of pixie cut. So I said, oh, not today. You know, this was last week when I had a haircut. Well, Monday, I, Tuesday, I called her and I said, let's do it, let's cut it. So here I am only three days since. It hasn't figured out how to lie yet. It's a very new cut and I'm very new to it. And you asked me to be on film. Well, and I have to say, that you have a very interesting hair color combination. And almost like looks like you have two heads of hair because once you have this shock of gray hair, but then it's very black on top. Yeah, and it didn't look that quite that way before when my hair was longer. If you look at the, um, the picture that's on the book, on the back of the book, it doesn't, it doesn't look that way because I had a lot of black hair. I mean, dark hair dark brown hair. Are you wearing a hat though? No. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. Now, people, some, one person said it looked as though I was wearing a yarmulke. That was, that was okay. I like that. Anne's book offers an interesting interfaith twist. She calls it braiding as she weaves stories from her own life, raised Christian with a Jewish father and Christian mother, into stories based on the life and times of Jesus in first century Palestine. So I'm with my music teacher in a small New York restaurant. We haven't seen each other for quite a while and she was a very important person, a mentor in my life. And I say we were sipping a little white wine and I was pleased to see a small bearded man dressed in black with a beret rise from a back table, gripping the neck of a guitar. Joyce didn't see him as he climbed onto a small raised platform, perched on a stool with his guitar resting on one extended leg and began strumming a bit of Bach. She loves Bach, I thought. But Joyce's face turned white and her eyes went dead. And now we go to first century Palestine. Before sunrise, Sarai bent over the fire making a small loaf of bread from the last of her flour. It would have to be enough for the hungry little mouths that would soon cry out for food. Her husband, Benjamin, had set out much earlier walking in the dark to the Sea of Galilee in the place by the olive tree, where he and other men would wait together, hoping for an offer of work that day. If he was fortunate and able to work a whole day on a fishing boat or in the fields, he would return home with enough money to buy food for that evening and part of the next day. The faces of his Sarah and their three small children were always in his mind as he waited under the tree, but he never let himself think about how they would look if he found no work that day. Temkin's book took 10 years to research, and it's based on solid scholarship. In uh, several cases, Jewish and Christian theologians were working together, some of them in Jerusalem, uh, to explore all of this. And uh, I, I began to um, want to write about that and to show Jesus within the context of his world. Jesus was not a Christian. Neither was Paul, by the way. I mean, they didn't come to, they didn't want to start new, a new religion. Um, he was a Torah reformer, basically. 
and um, and perhaps more than that. That depends on on how one sees it. But um, he was a passionate, earthy Jewish man. Can you find him on J Date? <laughs> <laughs> sure, friends of mine are looking into that. And so he was not a sort of floating up there, nicey nicey all the time. Um, Northern European. Not that they're always nice all the time, but you know what I mean. So I researched that, and people started telling me, well, you need to write that. And I thought, well, okay, but how to do that? I didn't want to write an academic kind of book for academic kinds of people. I wanted to write for a general audience, and particularly, I wanted to write for people who've been very hurt by the church when they were in the church and hurt by the church, or, or somewhere else and hurt by the church. And I wanted to do just a little bit to, per, to give a little bit of healing to the, the terrible history of anti-Semitism um, and the terrible injuries that Jews have suffered uh, uh, at the hands of the church. And um, so I started playing with writing stories and braiding together stories from my life and stories from Jesus's life. And I flesh out the Gospels, I make the characters real, and you know, Peter is kind of awfully pleased with himself much of the time. And uh, Mary Magdalene is perhaps the one who gets Jesus the most of all. She definitely was one of the disciples. It wasn't just guys, there were women there too. So how in some ways perhaps was this healing to you? Well, it was healing to me. It, it helped to bring the various parts of myself together. Um, and that's where it probably started, to heal myself. But then I decided I had something to say to others. Temkin, who is 77, brings to her book a lifetime of adventure, some of it terrifying. I was hijacked, and um, yes, from Milwaukee, I got on a train with a, co a plane with a colleague, and I fell into the seat and said, if I never see Milwaukee again, it'll be too soon, because it had been a horrible month at work. And the plane took off, and this guy came from the back with a suitcase and something in his right hand that looked like a long piece of wood and something shiny at the end. It was an ax. And um, so we were hijacked to Cuba. So that was pretty scary. And I braid that together with the story about the Good Samaritan, which, you know, we tell that story over and over and I sort of ho-hum, but really, Imagine if you were wounded there, um, lying on the ground, and one of your arch enemy groups came along and picked you up and put you on his horse, a donkey. Pretty frightening. Um, another scary one was I, I worked in Poland for four years. I didn't actually live there. I went back and forth every few months. And um, it, I was working a project for uh, helping people with severe mobility impairments to get out of their inaccessible apartments, to get some job training, to have internships that we helped provide, and to get into the workforce, and also to date and go to restaurants and dance and all those kinds of things. Well, we recruited people quickly and easily, but we found there were all these people in wheelchairs that didn't have seating cushions and you have to have seating cushions because otherwise people get pressure ulcers. It's a very, very dangerous thing. So I got quickly got together 12 seating cushions and took them on the plane. And of course, and I also had $10,000 worth of American Express traveler's checks because there was a whole Polish staff that I had to pay. So I had to declare all this at customs. And this was very shortly after communism had gone out. And, which, uh, and, and so they made me go into a special room, all white painted walls, where I just sat waiting for some official to come, surrounded by all these boxes 
about a dozen boxes of um, these seating cushions, and which I tried to label with things like caritas, hoping they remember some Latin, you know. <laughs> um, but I didn't know if they would understand what they were because people tended not to have them in Poland at that time. And I didn't know what they would do, and I didn't know what duty they might require, because, I, and I knew I didn't have the money in, in uh, cash to pay them if they required like 50% duty, which was a possibility. So I sat there for a long time and waited. I won't tell you what happened. You have to read the book to find out. <laughs> Some of her adventures are those of the spirit. She was also a nun for seven years. Spirituality, she points out, is not fixed, but a journey. I really do believe that the divine, that God, manifests in every single person. We're meant to be God incarnate in flesh, in flesh and blood, right here in this world. And we can only do that, or we do that only to the extent that we are who we are. Because uh, we, we cannot be a different reflection of God than who we're created to be. So by being authentic, um, that's the only way that we can walk the journey that um, helps to heal the world. That notion of being authentic, well, it takes us back to her thoughts about her hair as she sat in her stylist chair. I said to her, don't do my eyebrows. Uh, I, I don't want it, um, I don't want my eyebrows shaped. She was trying to persuade me to do that. It seems artificial, and she laughed, a friendly laugh. And she said, it's funny to me when people talk about it being artificial and then they're coloring their hair. And I thought, oh my gosh, and I'm doing all these retreats and t doing all this talking about being authentic and I'm coloring my hair. <laughs> Whatever you decide to do about your hair, I'll bet you'll want to share a selfie with your BFFs. That stands for best friends forever. Here's how in our Tech Talk. Hi, this is Jane Ratliff with Blue Hair Technology Group, and today we're going to talk about pictures. Pictures that someone else sends to you via email. Let's say your daughter just sent you an adorable picture of your grandson, and you want to save that picture on your iPad or your iPhone, and maybe even share it with your friends. I'm going to show you how easy it is. So the first thing you're going to do, obviously, since it was came to you through email, is we're going to open our email, and we're going to find that picture, or the email with the picture in it. And here's one that I just got. Now sometimes you will find that a picture comes across, and it actually comes across in the little box down here and it says tap to download. That means that it hasn't totally downloaded that, that image or that digital file yet. So you have to tap it in order for it to download and actually appear on your device. And so your picture's downloaded. And you can tell that because there's your picture. So your picture is contained within the email. So how do you save that? Very simple. There is an arrow, if you go to the top right of your screen, there is an arrow that actually goes to the left. You tap on that, up comes a menu. It says reply, forward, save image, and print. Save image is what you want to do. So we're just going to tap save image. Now there's no confirmation that comes up, but believe me, that image has now been saved to your iPad. So let's go take a look in your photos for that image. So I'm going to go back to my main screen and I'm going to, the way I like to bring up my pictures is I, I swipe up from the bottom. This is your, called your control panel. And I just tap on my camera icon. And then I tap on that small image in the corner and it brings up my gallery of photos. And here's the picture that I just saved. The picture that you just saved will really be the last one or should be the first one that comes up. And here's the picture that I saved. So very simple. Again, the way you do this, just wanted to repeat it, is once your picture's been downloaded in your email, 
you go to this arrow button. You tap it, you tap save image, and the image immediately saves to your iPad or iPhone. Now let's say you wanted to share that with someone on Facebook. It's very simple. We're going to bring up the picture. Here's the picture. And again, we had talked about this earlier. There is an icon down there called the sharing icon. If you have downloaded Facebook, the Facebook app on your iPad, when you tap this sharing icon, one of your options is Facebook. One of your options or one of the apps that you can share that picture with is Facebook. This is extremely convenient. So if you haven't downloaded the Facebook app, download the Facebook app. It really makes a big difference. I'm going to tap Facebook and immediately my Facebook, my Facebook newsfeed pops up here in this little dialog box. I can say, here I am getting ready to, what, do a video, do a video. How's that sound? Do a video. So you can type it all in there. And now all I have to do is hit post. And it has posted to my Facebook page. I didn't have to go into Facebook. I didn't have to do any of that. Again, that's because I've downloaded the Facebook app. And once the Facebook app is on your iPad or your iPhone, it's connected to your account. And that is an extremely easy way to share a great picture of your grandbaby with all of your friends. I'm Jane Ratliff with Blue Hair Technology Group. We hope you learned a lot about the barbershop secrets of men's and women's hair styling. You know, I think I'm probably going to let my hair turn gray, but I will for right now get this pencil out of it. You know, that's my way I put that You thing. don't have any gray hair yet anyway. Oh, yes, I do right mm -hmm. here. Good. Well, I tell you what, it's happy and healthy for you to be who you are when you're ready for whatever stages. And that's what we're about at Life Plus, letting you be you. So we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us. Have a great week and we'll see you soon.